Welcome to the Get a Camera podcast, where we explain the business, creative, and technical aspects of photography and filmmaking. Download the Get a Camera app, where you can save up to 40% on equipment rentals. Now here's the founder of Get a Camera, Mark Hedengren. All right, welcome to the Get a Camera podcast. Now, today, I'm going to explain why I'm doing this podcast in the first place. I mean, why would you do a podcast about photography when there are already plenty of other good ones? And I admire and respect many of them. To me, I was listening to other podcasts and even just looking in literature in general. And one thing that I've always found missing was that they never really combined the technical, the creative, and the business aspects of photography. They would always focus on one or the other, be really technical, be really creative, but they never really talked with them about these things as one cohesive unit. They are, they do all those aspects, technical, creative, and business, they all go together because that's what you need to do to make images in photography and filmmaking. That's how we get stuff made. That's how you get images created. That's how you get stuff up on the screen. That's how you get people to view your work. So that's why I wanted to do a podcast that combined all three of these elements. I wanted to interview people in the business of photography and filmmaking, and not just the usual people you hear from, not just the George Lucases, not just the rock stars. I wanted to get like every level, like a level of job, like someone who's just starting out as a photographer at a small newspaper, or somebody who's a curator of photography, or somebody who runs a modeling agency, or something like that. Because we deal with all these organizations, and it's really interesting to think what they're looking for and what they want and problems they have, and maybe how you can help them solve the problems they have. So that's why I wanted to do this, because I didn't feel there's a podcast out there covering all these aspects. And also for me personally, I've always wanted to be a teacher. Both my parents were teachers. Virtually everybody in my family is a teacher or has been a teacher at one point in their life. And basically, like I was in the final three for a teaching position, a full-time teaching position at the Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD, as it is sometimes known. I had a bit of a crisis because I realized that I had, quite frankly, I was making a lot more money and had a lot more freedom doing what I was doing than I would if I was teaching. But I still wanted to teach. So I figured, well, you know, I might as well make a podcast because then I can kind of scratch that itch (laughs) that I don't have to give up my entire life to do it. So that's why I'm doing it. And so even in this podcast, I'm going to start out by talking about a business aspect. And this is a very elementary business thing. But for some reason, it never gets taught to in the creative arts. I mean, this should be in any class, this should be something that's brought up regularly. But it never is. And also, I do think in the arts, this is the art side, there's a very strong resistance to talking about, I mean, I don't even like the word business, I like how to get things done. I think that's a much better term. But there's a strong resistance to that. And my experience is, I mean, you know, a lot of people go into the arts had very rich parents. And I think they go into the arts because they know they're never going to make as much money as their dad. So they kind of go in like, so they're non-compete. They're doing something different. They're kind of rejecting what their parents had done and forging their own path. And I don't deny them that. But unfortunately, not all of us are getting a $5,000 check from our parents every month. And so that's where we need to keep this stuff in mind so we can keep on working. And I think they kind of, this is, I have to admit, this is my experience in graduate school. Like they kind of scorn the idea of like budgets or, you know, like to me it was like they couldn't understand why I wouldn't spend $200 every week and partying. Whereas I was eating, you know, living off of like a $3 a day food budget. (laughs) So even bringing up money in any capacity they find is vulgar and obscene. But I think it's valuable for people to participate in the arts who aren't getting huge checks from their parents. And the way you do that is by being mindful of how you get things done, you know. And also, I mean, quite frankly, in my experience, this kind of mindset of going into art when you don't really have anything to say It's just kind of like a reaction against is never successful. If you have something to say, you will do anything it takes. And that includes learning some very basic business stuff 
to get it out there, to have yourself heard. And uh, I don't know, partially I think postmodernism ties in to that a bit, which I would talk about in another podcast. And then on the creative side, I mean, on the business side, like for some reason, like they never talk about creativity. I mean, that's the very core of everything. Everything is like creative. Like when George Eastman, you know, made Kodak, he was just a businessman. But he had to have a lot of creative insights to one, recognize sheet film was a thing, and then then invent roll film. And these were really important steps in the making of photography, and they were very creative. Like if they're doing a Harvard case study of Kodak, they don't talk about that element because they can't quantify it. They can't say, like, why did George Eastman realize that film was the next big thing? You know, so they just don't even bring it up. They talk about other aspects because that's something you can quantify. And that's a difficulty in art, too. Like, there's really no way to quantify creativity, but it still exists. And we all know it and we're all seeking after it. Because, honestly, if you're not trying to do really great work all the time, why are you doing it? So I don't know how to really quantify creativity either. And anybody who tells you they know how to quantify creativity is just lying or self-deceived because there is no way to quantify it. But there are ways to kind of foster creativity and to help bring ideas. And then as far as like the technical and photography and filmmaking, particularly nowadays, things are changing. You know, things are changing a lot. Filmmaking and photography was largely the same for like 100 years. In the past 10 years, like everything has changed. I mean, when the Red One came out and you could do a, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean shot digitally, like big budget Hollywood films shot purely digitally. I mean, it changed filmmaking, you know, all of a sudden. In fact, I still can't get over this. Like you can rent a Red Epic for probably around three or four hundred dollars a day. And you can be using the same camera or better camera that shot Spider-Man. I mean, back in, you know, with film, it would cost you a thousand dollars every 10 minutes you've filmed. For a 35 millimeter film, between film processing, scanning, everything, it's about $1,000 for every 10 minutes of footage. So this is huge, huge improvement. And this is changing every day. There's always new cameras, always new features coming out, like low light photography is becoming much easier. And these help facilitate or you use them to communicate better. So all these things are important. They all come together and we're going to talk about them in unity in podcasts. We're not going to like quarantine them like this is business, this is creative, this is technical. We're going to merge them all together into one big pot of goodness to hopefully make it easier for you to communicate the things you want to talk about, the things that you have itching inside of you that you really want to say to the world. And art, of course, is a very effective way to do that and through the ages. (laughs) So I'm really excited to explain these things to you. So I'm going to start with the four P's of business. Now, first P is product. Now, in art, that would be your photographs or your film, you know, or the movies you make. The second P is price. Now, price is how much that you charge for that. The third P is placement or distribution. We kind of fudge it and say placement. How do people get access to that product? And the Fourth P is promotion or marketing. So we're going to talk how in film and photography to apply those four P's. So whenever you begin a project, begin with these four P's in mind. Begin, to quote Stephen R. Covey, begin with the end in mind. So think like, what am I going to charge for this product? What am I going to make? What's my product? What am I going to charge for it? How am I going to distribute this product? And how am I going to promote this product? So you might say, okay, I want to do a film. You know, you shouldn't let, you know, money just motivate you. You know, you should really, you know, only do what you really want to say because it's so much work. You shouldn't compromise your vision or waste your life talking about something you don't want to talk about. But that doesn't mean you don't want people to actually see it. So what product am I going to make? Let's say I'm really passionate about fish populations in the Great Lakes. Okay, so I'm going to do a documentary on the fish populations in the Great Lakes. So what's my price on that? You're like, well, I make money from shooting uh, commercials for General Motors, so I don't really care how much money I make on the documentary. I just really want it out there. So I'm going to just put it on Vimeo. I'm going to put it on YouTube. 
and let people watch it for free. All right, so you got that down. Now, how am I going to promote this documentary? You're like, well, I'm going to hoping to get a lot of press coverage because of declining fish populations. I want to get into some major film festivals like Sundance or South by Southwest. And then I hope I'll get more press coverage there. So we have our product. It's a documentary about declining fish populations in the Great Lakes. We have our price, which is free. We have our distribution strategy, which is YouTube and Vimeo. And we have our promotion, which is we're hoping a PR campaign of activism about Save the Fish and along with film festivals to get the word out there. And, of course, if a distributor comes on board, you may, like, actually be able to charge for your documentary or, you know, get a DVD and make a few thousand. But let's do it for something else, all right? Because that's a big thing. Let's do it for a feature film. Okay, so we're going to do our product is it's going to be a thriller with Nicole Kidman or Renee Zeldwiger <laughs> or uh, let's say uh, with uh, Kristen Stewart. We're going to have a thriller with Kristen Stewart. That's our product. And our price is going to be an $8 movie ticket because we're going to get a theatrical release or a $16 movie ticket. And then our distribution is going to be Cinemark and Carmarkey Theaters. And then our promotion is going to be we have Kristen Stewart in it. So that's going to give us some press. And we're going to have a $50 million ad campaign, which is going to be on Internet. We're going to advertise on the Fandango app in addition to click ads and a Facebook campaign. Okay, so now we have our four Ps. But you really should think of the channels you're going to be able to distribute your product in when you're done. Because you don't want to, like, finish something. don't want to finish a body of work and be like, oh, now what do I do with it? You know, like in photography, like, I'll do a project. And it'll be like, well, my product is I'm going to do a project on um, the cliffs of San Marin County. And then my price is going to be, it's going to be in galleries, is going to be in a gallery show, and it's going to be a two thousand dollars a print, and the gallery is going to send out a mailer to all of its previous clients to promote it. So there we go. We have our product, we have our price, we have our promotion, and we have our distribution. So that is basically the four P's. So whenever you start a project, think of those four P's before you begin. All right. So now I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about. Everything. I mean, this is like, to me, this is not exclusive to art, to film, to photography. I'm going to talk about ideas, communication, and team building. Really, everything happens with that. I don't care if you're putting in a cement walkway or if you're, you know, if you're making the next Academy Award Best Picture film. All of these things are done with ideas, communicating those ideas and team building. Now, again, like I've talked about creativity, but ideas, who knows where ideas come from? In fact, a writer, a New York Times bestseller author said this the best. He said, well, I don't know where the ideas come from. People often ask me that, but I do know they don't come out unless I'm sitting at the desk. And uh, Bjorn of uh, ABBA fame, (laughs) he said, you know, creativity is like a little rabbit. Like, I don't know what it is. It's like a little rabbit. You're waiting to come out of the hole. And it won't come out unless you're sitting right here. And he was sitting at a keyboard when he said this. So I sit at the piano until the ideas come. And, of course, Bjorn, I mean, Abba is incredibly prolific. So, you know, that's a good statement. I don't know. You might have mixed feelings on the music. But I'm sure many other, your favorite rock musicians, the Rolling Stones and stuff, would say similar things. Like, unless you're working, you don't get ideas to come for some reason. Like, your good ideas, they're not going to come to you when you're just, you know, hanging out, doing nothing. Unless you're work actively working on making work, the no good ideas are going to come. Also, you know, this thing about ideas, too. There's two prevalent theories of knowledge. One is John Locke. And his was that we learn everything through our experience. And then there's Kant, where it's like all of our knowledge is inborn. And I don't really know if I agree with either one of those. I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, I don't think it's all through experience, because if all knowledge was through experience, 
you could create a system to make new Van Goghs and make a new wonderfully creative painter just on demand because you just control the right experiences and then they'd you'd have an ingenious artist. But it doesn't work that way. But I don't believe, I mean, clearly experience matters because people who, you know, it's not like good art just comes from nowhere, like from no experience. It's not like you can just give 18-year-old who's never experienced art a paintbrush and they're going to make ingenious work. That just doesn't happen. So I kind of believe like, all trivial knowledge, like all things that kind of like are just nice to know that help build our learn through experience and like listening to this podcast. But then like significant knowledge is inborn and I'm not quite sure how to teach it. I mean, nobody does. It's like just either kind of you have it or you don't. But, you know, that's kind of a fuzzy definition of reconciling those two theories is that it's kind of really both. There's no like pure Locke or pure Kantian ideas. So that's how you can do it. I also think you get a lot of good ideas by, of course, and this is, would be Locke, is like experiencing as much artwork in your medium and other mediums as possible because that just gives you a lot of ideas and it's not good to make art in a vacuum. Also, it's just a lot of fun. If you like your medium enough to participate in it, it shouldn't be a chore to go look at movies and go look at photographs. You should really enjoy doing it. Like, wow, I get to go to the movies. Good times. Or I get to go look at photographs. Or I get to go to the art museum. Or I, I get to read a book. I mean, whatever it is. Like, that should be just really fun for you. So fun, you'd almost rather do it than anything else. The only thing you'd rather do more is actually make art. <laughs> so, of course, you can get, get stuck in a trap of just always reading and never creating or always looking at movies and never making movies. But you do need to make that plunge. So that's what I want to say about ideas. The next one is communicating. Now, communicating is really, you know, that's ability to articulate your ideas. Like, unless you can kind of talk people on board to your ideas. And I mean, this is something that's really lost in the art world. I mean, it's kind of like this fallacy. Like, if you go to a show at the New York Museum of Modern Art, you see, you know, uh, you see big artists, by big artists, exhibit by, I'm trying to think, by... What's an exhibit I saw there recently? Exhibit by Sebastiano Salgado. And it's kind of an illusion that just Salgado walked into the museum, hung his prints and said, yeah, this is it. It's done. I'm the only person involved in this. That's not the case at all. Like, and if you, especially if you ever met Salgado or heard him speak, he's incredibly charismatic. He's really good at communicating his ideas. And he's really good at like kind of talking people into doing what he wants to do or convincing them that this is a good idea. So there's a huge negotiation between curators, directors, publishers, things like that, that he's constantly doing. But in the very core of that is communicating his ideas. And that's why writing is so important. I mean, most all successful artists I know and filmmakers are actually pretty good writers as well. I mean, to varying degrees, ranging from exquisite writers to okay writers. But you'll almost never meet someone who's like a downright poor writer or a poor public speaker because they couldn't get anywhere if they did. Even though, once again, that's kind of a myth in the art world, kind of this, you know, idiot savant who's really bad at everything but then just creates. Uh, it's really important to be able to communicate your ideas. And more than that, it's really important to, like, convince people that you're not going to embarrass the heck out of them when they show you to other people. <laughs> like... Like, well, when you talk to my boss, are you going to be embarrassing to me? And you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be embarrassing. When I introduce you to the director of the programming director at Sundance, you're not going to, like, embarrass me, right? You're going to be able to talk about your film intelligently and say why he should program it. So that is it, all right? You know, especially on a film set, when you're communicating to crew, you need to communicate to the sound guy, the director of photography, or, and if you are one of those guys, you need to communicate with a director. It's like one big game of communication, but it's very apparent in film, but that's true in all disciplines, you know, especially books or visual art. There's a lot more people involved than just the name on the front of the cover or the front of the exhibit or in the credit, opening credits. Communication is key because of that. And that leads to my next thing, team building. Now, team building is hugely important. In fact, I really think you can gauge how your career is going 
by what quality of people will agree to work with you. Like if you can call up uh, a Steven Soderbergh and say, hey, here's my script. Do you want to direct it? And if he'll say, yeah, I want to direct your script. Like you've hit a whole level, you know, or if like you're Steven Soderbergh. And I'm sure he went through this, you know, like all these independent guys who came up through the film festival circuit, Sundance in particular. Like he must have been like, wow, there's a really big A-list actor in my movie. This is amazing. I can't believe they're actually agreeing to work with me. They're amazing. They're really good at what they do. So that is a process we always go through is trying to get people to work with us. And this is a funny thing because there is a tendency among some people to kind of want to surround themselves with people that are dumber than they are or not as good as they are. So they look really like the best person in the room. And that's a huge mistake. You should want to surround yourself with the absolute smartest, best, most talented people you can possibly meet. And you can do that through your great ideas, your great communication ability, and then great people. And so these great people, they're just going to make you look good. Like if you're in a room and you're surrounded by good people, you look wonderful. This isn't a competition. You're just trying to do the best work possible. And so if you feel like competitive around people around you, and you feel like that they're going to make you look bad because they're so good at what they do, you're never going to get anywhere. You want to be the dumbest person in the room. Like you want to be like just like in awe of these people who you're working with. And it's like magic when you're working with good, talented people. It's kind of like, wow, that idea is so much better than mine. I mean, it's not like two plus two. Like let's say your ideas are worth two and then their ideas are worth two. So you get four. That's not the way it works with really great people when really great people are working together. It's like two plus two equals 10. It's like for some reason, like having more great people all working together, you get really fantastic work. And, you know, I think like a lot of stuff you see coming out of Pixar or a lot of those great photographers, you know, or any great artists, it's because they surrounded themselves with really great people, people who are smarter than them. Even John Steinbeck, he practically wrote a novel about how wonderful his editor was and what a big help he was. So surround yourself with fantastic people. And if you feel any sort of urge that you should need to surround yourself with people who are not as smart as you or not as talented as you are, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You want to surround yourself with the absolute best people ever. I can't iterate that enough. I mean, it's also, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, I've really liked working with the wonderful people I've worked with in the past and really talented people. And nothing is more infuriating than watching somebody on a project like hurt the body of work. You know, when you get to it and you're like, oh, my goodness, you're ruining the body. You're ruining it. Holy cow. This was the biggest mistake (laughs) I've made because you care so much about what you're saying and you care so much about the thing you're making that that just seems like the worst, that's like the worst nightmare ever. So, I mean, I've learned to be like very selective on who I work with and really be very careful in picking them. And also, quite frankly, if it's not right, I'm actually now I'm pretty quick to fire people <laughs> or fire is a harsh word, but, you know, invite them to work on another project somewhere else because it's just so important. You have to think about what you're saying, the product you're making, the body of work you're making and how much you're invested in that and how much work you're going to have to do afterward to help promote it and, you know, get a distribution, things like that. So the work always has to come first. But again, build a great team. And I say this because I have made every mistake in the book on team building. So I've realized how important it is. I know when you're first starting out, you're just kind of like, yeah, we'll get like me and a bunch of friends. We'll go make a movie. And there's a lot of value to that. That's a lot of fun. You should do that. But as you make a few, you're going to begin to realize like what works, you know, and who will actually stick with a project. Who's not going to quit after two hours of filming? Who's not going to, you know, just drop the ball completely. You really kind of get a sense for that. But that's it. So that's what I covered. All right. So that's why I'm doing this podcast. I want to combine creativity technical and business aspects all into one great ball of delicious goodness. And then I discussed the four P's of business, product, price, placement, and promotion, and how you should think about all those elements before you begin making something. So begin with the end in mind.
again, to quote Stephen Covey. Then I talked about ideas, communication, and team building. And if you have great ideas and you can communicate those ideas well to other people, as a consequence, build great teams, there will be absolutely no stopping you. You will make fantastic work and you will be very happy with what you're doing. So thanks again. Please check out all the other podcasts. So I also want to say the reason why I'm doing a podcast as opposed to YouTube video series is because in photography and filmmaking, I find we do a lot of driving, driving to locations, things like that. We also like edit photographs in Lightroom. You know, we do a lot of activities that require our eyes. So I feel that a podcast is a really great medium for photographers and filmmakers because we can do something with our ears while we're doing something with our eyes. You know, like while we're driving, we can listen to a podcast. While we're editing photos, we can listen to a podcast. So because our ears are not occupied, they're not actively engaged. I mean, it's funny. I do know people who like watch TV while they're editing photographs or, you know, selecting photographs. I don't know how you can do that because you need your eyes to look at the photographs. You can't look at the TV. I'm guessing they really just listen to the TV while they edit. So listen to the podcast. You know, you might get some good ideas, some good tips. They'll help you work better. So enjoy. All right. And also the get a camera app. I'll do another podcast on that. But it's a really great way to cut your equipment rental costs by up to 40%. I mean, it's pretty astonishing what it can save you and also how you can make money off of your own equipment. So download that, check it out. I think that'd be a big help to you. But again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing to this podcast. And I hope you enjoy it. We'll have a lot of good guest speakers or people I talk with about photography and filmmaking and a lot of other maybe ideas that will help you. Thank you for listening. Be sure to download the Get a Camera app to get some great gear and start creating today.